Are financial conflict of interest rules hurting the practice of medicine? Dr. Thomas Stossel is the American Cancer Society Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Stossel spoke at Reason Weekend in St. Petersburg, Florida to deliver a contrarian take on a subject that has drawn national media attention, the excessive regulation of financial arrangements between physicians and the pharmaceutical industry. I'm talking about a sliver of the huge healthcare issue um, that I hope I can convince you is important and is worth doing something about. So it is the financial conflict of interest mania. Now, I put it in quotes because it's a sort of meaningless term. It's a code word for any transfer of value from a medical products company, device company, drug company, to a physician. And it presupposes the potential or actual toxicity of that transfer of value. And so these transfers must be disclosed, managed, or eliminated. Now, what I plan to do is to tell you a few things about me, my background, as to how I got to this, and then I will describe what the mania is, and it is a mania because it has no substance, although it has substantive effects. I'll tell you what's wrong with it, and then I hope I can kick off a discussion as to what should we do about it. Now, you've heard my background, but most of what I've done in my life is research, and I do research on a sort of arcane topic, which is how your cells crawl. Did you know that your cells crawl? So here's your pearl for the day. Each one of you makes 100 billion white blood cells. And they get a free ride in the blood for a little while, but their real job is to come out of the bloodstream into every part of your body and find, eat, and kill germs. That's why you're walking and talking, because they do that. And uh, it, each one crawls about an eighth of an inch, and 100 billion times an eighth of an inch is over twice around the Earth every day in each one of us, and we don't even know it. Now what's cool about cell, white blood cell crawling is you can see it. That's a white blood cell, the big thing in the middle. The dark things are red blood cells, and that little white black dot is a germ that it's chasing. It's sort of like a good version of the IRS going after the Tea Party. <laughs> and I spent 40 years doing research on what's under the hood as to uh, how this process works, this machine works. Cool, huh? <laughs> Now, the good news is I've been very successful at that. I've spent a lot of your tax money on to do this research, and I've won all kinds of prizes and awards and uh, gotten into elite uh, clubs. But the bad news is no one has lived one second longer or better because of this research. Now, random events can sometimes bail you out. In the late 1980s, I was asked to join the scientific advisory board of one of the pioneering biotech companies, Biogen. And the reason these people are in the silly sort of configuration is I made some smart remark, and then they all put those beanies on. Uh, but these folks are some pretty uh, cool dudes. They're Nobel Prize winners and other luminaries. Um, and th the experience at Biogen sort of shocked me out of my socialist youth. I realized that uh, and how difficult it is to convert research into, pr into practical ends, and it started me on the path of trying to do that. Now, I want to call your attention to the, the gentleman in the circle. His name is Ken Murray. He was a Scottish biologist who Biogen paid to, in his laboratory, do some work that led to a vaccine for the disease, the liver disease, hepatitis B. And Biogen took it forward, and that made Biogen, a, for the first time, a profitable company. And uh, the, 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 as a result, uh, Murray, who had stock and stock options in the company, became extremely wealthy. But hepatitis B causes liver cancer. It's the major cause of liver cancer in the world, and it will be eradicated thanks to his work. So the value for humanity is incalculable, and the fact that he got rich is not, shouldn't be an issue. But remember that story as we go forward, because I will uh, come back to it. Now, timing is everything, and be, as, as I was learning about uh, the market at Biogen, the conflict of interest mania emerged. And I've been in medicine almost 50 years, and as you can see so for the first half of my career, no one talked about conflict of interest. But 
uh, it then just came out abruptly in all these books and articles, and uh, it's astonishing how it had the legs that it has and the amount of material that this gets. Now, who's putting this stuff out? Well, I come in two flavors. I call them instigators and enablers. Now, some of the instigators are committed believers, but most of them are opportunists. And so the, the, the academics have discovered they can make a living declaring that conflict of interest is a national emergency. Of course, the media loves corruption, whether it exists or not. And politicians, Charles Grassley has been a, a major perpetrator of this. And then the arch instigators are the lawyers. We'll be saying more about that. Now, it's the enablers, or the people who run the medical profession at the top, who, are, who make the rules. And they, what they really care about is not having their New York Times beat them up or Charles Grassley come after them. And so they have just rolled over and accepted the tenets of this mania. Now, what does the mania say? Fundamentally, what it says is that industry isn't worth the value for money. All it does is market. It markets products that are no better, are just more expensive, and less safe than what's already out there. And then finally, you read about these enormous eye-popping fines that get inflicted on the, on the industry. And this is the smoking gun that industry is fundamentally criminal. So they've been very successful as a result of these allegations in promoting rules. And so we have massive confession. Everything has to be disclosed. And then that information is used to restrict the kind of rewards that I told you about that Ken Murray got, who unfortunately died last year. But he could not, because you cannot at my medical school, have sponsored research from a company if you have equity in that company. And that's ridiculous. Arguably, we wouldn't have a hepatitis B vaccine if uh, th those rules had been in effect when he did that work. And then the real whipping boy of the conflict of interest mania is marketing. It's that marketing that doctors are incapable of sorting out truth from fiction, and so there should be complete apartheid between the sales forces of industry and the medical profession. Now, Obamacare, of course, is front and center in your discussions, but how many of you are familiar with the Sunshine Act? That's a problem. What the Sunshine Act is, is that every transfer of value of $10 or more must be disclosed to the federal government. And it, it has, in effect right now, it will appear on public websites. The $10 figure says a lot. It says how mean-spirited the mania is, the idea that $10 is enough to cause corruption. Now, what's wrong with this? Well, the main thing is, they get it totally wrong about value. Now, in that 50 years that I've been in medicine, it has gotten incomparably better than when I started out. And the statistics are there. So the number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease. As you can see, it has fallen by 60%. The death rate, of course, remains one per person. So you don't die of the number one cause. Now you are at risk for number two. That's cancer. But as you can see, cancer mortality remained flat and is at an all-time low. Some of you may remember when the HIV AIDS epidemic came out and there were apocalyptic predictions. It would bankrupt the healthcare system and there was the death rate went up and then went down and it went away and people now live with AIDS. All of this progress is because of the tools that physicians now have and those tools come from industry and from industry collaborating with physicians. It's inconceivable that if all industry did was market ineffective, unsafe, expensive products that we could have this amazing pro progress. But that's what they claim. Now, you all know Moore's Law. Moore's Law that chips get exponentially more powerful and exponentially cheaper. Well, in medical product development, it's the opposite. So I call it Erom's Law. Over my lifetime, it has become 100 times more expensive 
to get a drug approved by the FDA. And you see the dismal statistic that one in 8,000 drug candidates actually makes it to approval, and you see how long it takes and how expensive it is. Why is that? Well, it's not because, as the conflict of interest mania says, because industry's bad intentions. It's because of failure a huge failure rate. Now, you may be familiar that product of the approvals require going through these phases that have different aspects of what uh, the research that goes on to uh, determine the safety and efficacy of a product. But what you, the most important point is that around half of these attempts fail at each step of the process. And that's why it takes so long and it's so expensive. Now, why is the failure rate so high? It's because biology is a bitch. <laughs> it's not intuitively obvious that that should be so. I mean, we can build airplanes that fly themselves and never crash unless they're flown by crazy Malaysians. But it's, the reason for that is because we designed them. We designed them to be predictable. And that predictability is what allows for that amazing technical uh, competence that we have. But in medicine and biology, it's not like that. We evolved, and the success of our evolution, our survival, depends on our unpredictability. Because that, like that germ that that white blood cell was chasing is very good at keying in to our moving parts. And if all our moving parts were predictable, we'd have been wiped out eons ago. So that incredible unpredictability is the basic explanation. Uh, for this difficulty and explains why the companies have to be profitable. They have to be able to take as many shots on goal as they can because they're going to have all these failures. So the profitability is essential and to be profitable they have to be able to sell. Now the mantra that the conflict of interest mania sells that this marketing is dishonest, devious, and doctors can't deal with it is just false. Because bias, they always talk about bias. Bias can be evidence-based. I'm biased towards disc brakes and seat belts and not smoking. Uh, and it's based on evidence. The marketing apparatus can only tell doctors what the FDA has approved. And that's very rigorous evidence. There are enough practices, however, now that have restricted marketing personnel from their practices that an economist at Temple University did a huge study and showed that in the, in the practices that restricted the drug reps, they were slower to adopt a new product, but more importantly, they were slower to stop prescribing a product that had been shown to have side effects. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about this is because I've had to work my butt off to accomplish all those things that uh, Peter talked about. They just make things up. I've never been allowed to just make things up. I've always had to get evidence, and it's unconscionable that they're allowed to get away with it. I mean, this is just not true. There's no FDA that tells Mount Sinai what it can uh, say about prostate surgery. And you see, if you flew down here, you look at the airplane ads, it's just full of this kind of puff. puff. Every major pharmaceutical device company has paid these enormous fines. Uh, for healthcare fraud. And if you read the fine print, it's specific drugs that were, were supposedly marketed off-label or bribes and kickbacks. Is this true? Does this make them felons? Well, the answer is no. It's a creative legal strategy. Now, once a product is approved, it gets a label. The label says what the company can say about that product. Once it's approved for anything, though, a doctor can prescribe it for anything else. And in fact, off-label prescribing is very common, especially in cancer treatment, in children where no trials have been done. In fact, it would be malpractice not to prescribe some, many medications off-label. And at least until recently, being paid to consult for a device company was perfectly legal. Off-label promotion, however, since the Kefauver-Harris amendments to the FDA in the 60s, is illegal. And of course, kickbacks are illegal. So in the, for most of history, the FDA would keep an eye on companies. And if they thought there was off-label promotion, they'd tell them to stop. And if they didn't stop, they'd get a prosecutor to, to, to go after them. But about a decade ago, a creative strategy evolved that was based on false claims. Now, false claims date back to the Civil War 
when, which it was used to punish contractors who billed the government for services they didn't do. False claims have some unique features. One is that if you get a conviction, the damages are three times. So that's why the numbers are so great. You wait long enough for the company to sell enough product and you got a huge number. Second, it's very generous with whistleblowers. Then there's a third component, which I'll come to in a second. Now, in order to get the conviction, the prosecutor, after, because it's not the company that's making the false claim, it's not the company that's doing the prescribing, the doctor's doing the prescribing. So the prosecutor has to prove that the company's marketing made the doctor prescribe off-label. Now, that's ridiculous. There's no way you could prove that in court. But it never goes to court. It doesn't go to court because the companies settle. And as a result, there's never judicial review. Now, why do they settle? It's because of that third difference between false claims and other kinds of, of, of uh, uh, prosecutions. There is a draconian penalty called debarment. Debarment means the company cannot sell any of its products to the federal government. No Medicare, no Medicaid, no S-chip. That's capital punishment. There's no way a company can risk that. And the prosecutors pile up t so many indictments that as improbable as it is, if only one uh, gets the, to be a conviction, they're debarred. Now, Another piece of evidence that this is bogus is that individuals who don't care about debarment, they care about their reputation, when they fight it in court, they win. This is arguably the most damaging aspect of the conflict of interest mania. And it's probably, to a large extent, responsible for the principal costs. So payments from device companies to surgeons have gone down by 75% in the last five years. Corporate subsidy for medical education has gone down by 50% in the same time, and the number of medical education events has dropped by the same amount. That's problematic, especially in rural areas where we want doctors to keep up and uh, they, they no longer uh, have, have access to this education. And then finally, th that what Sunshine Act that intuitively, well, what's wrong with transparency? Well, nobody ever asks, what does it cost? The, the act is 300 pages of legal gibberish, and a huge number of lawyers and compliance bureaucrats are going to have to tell the companies how to comply with it, and it's going to cost billions that would be better put into research and development. Now, why? If there's nothing there and it's costly, does it go from strength to strength? I think it's because we've been wimps. Especially the industry's been wimps. Say, so we do good things, we do good things. Oh, no, it's, it, there's no, it, uh, flat earth versus round earth is not a difference of opinion. It's a matter of right and wrong. And the companies should say, no, we're not corrupt. You're corrupt because you're intellectually dishonest. But they haven't done that. So what should we do? Well, I've, I sort of came out of the closet with this about 10 years ago. And I've probably given... 150 talks, panels, interviews, written 50 op-ed articles and uh, articles on, on, on this topic. It's gone from bad to worse. I wish we could mobilize industry. I wish we could get patients to understand that this is, this is uh, n not going to help them and, and it's going to slow innovation. Um, but I'm a bit discouraged at this point. So I need your help, and your ideas. So every time I give a talk to a scientific audience, I have to show a slide like this. That's statutory at professional societies and education events, uh, where th the purpose is so you can see that I lie, cheat, and steal, and you can't trust anything that I have to say. I have gotten a small grant from the Searle Freedom Trust, which I think supports you folks. Um, to, to continue this work. Um, they're concerned that I've had no success in changing policy. And uh, so I really hope that in the course of the discussion today and over the rest of the weekend, that you can give me some ideas and uh, to maybe, or tell me to give it up and stop tilting the windmill and go to my day job. In any case, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.